pre-med scenes virtual shadowing session today with Dr. Irabunda. My name is Michael and I'll be today's host. To introduce her, Dr. Irabunda is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist based in Queens, New York. Dr. Irabunda practiced for four years as an active duty Army ob gyn and now works for NYC Health and Hospitals. She's a member of Peloton's Health and Wellness Advisory Committee, expert contributor for Mind Body Green and serves as women's health advocate and an ambassador of wellness to the world. Before we begin, for our audience, I have a couple of reminders. We encourage you to turn on your cameras if you're able to. The session will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel for your um, viewership later on. And there will be a Q&A save for the end of today's session. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat or unmute during the Q&A. But with that covered, Dr. Urbunda, feel free to take it away. All right, so hi everyone. I'm Dr. Urbunda. I am, as he said, a board certified OBGYN. I'm based here in New York City. I work currently for um, the public hospital system here, New York City Health and Hospital. So I take care of primarily pretty much any type of patient, but um, most of my patients are um, immigrants, may or may not be, um, they may be undocumented, some of them, a lot of people who are either have no insurance or underinsured Medicaid patients. So I take care of a variety of different people. Um, I've had a variety of different experiences as well. So I was in the military for um, eight years active duty, four years as a reservist while I was in medical school. So I did my residency at Walter Reed in the DC metro area and then um, served for four years after that in upstate New York at Fort Drum as an OBGYN. Um, after that, I was in private practice for a year and then I started working for the public hospital system. Um, in terms of things I did, you know, like schooling wise, like I went to undergrad at University of Pennsylvania in Philly. And then I actually didn't know if I wanted to be a doctor, like a, phys a physician. And so I did some research. I was thinking I was going to do public health or something along those lines. So I actually worked for two years at Columbia School of Social Work on a project that was like public health focused. Um, and through that, I decided I really wanted to go to med school. So I ended up doing a post back because I didn't do all of my um, requirements, prereqs for, for medical school. So I finished those up and then I um, applied and went to Albert Einstein College of Medicine here in New York City for med school. And that's like the long and the short of it. Right now, I not only see my patients and do clinical work, but I have kind of um, some other work that I do in terms of advising. So uh, I do some, I'm on the medical advisory board for Peloton, um, specifically for their reproductive health geared um, content. I also um, am now also going to be serving on, well, I serve also on an advisory board for Johnson & Johnson in terms of like social media and healthcare professionals and how to kind of like work on that stuff. And then I work, um, I'm now gonna be working on an advisory board with Moderna specifically about like vaccine education. So um, those are kind of the things I do in that respect. But I also do a lot of health education and things like that on Instagram and TikTok and on my podcast. So yeah, that's that. And I'm open to questions. So you can ask me anything or everything, I guess. Yeah, sounds great. Well, we, we love to hear um, the story behind, you know, your eventual eventual um, standing as a physician. Now, each person has their own journey and story and yours is no exception. It's a really unique one. Um, can you take us through exactly why you chose ob -GYN? Sure. So for me, when I was doing the research that I was doing at Columbia, um, it was a project for couples where they were serodiscordant for HIV. So one partner was HIV positive, the other one was HIV negative, and we were using behavioral um, 
techniques to get them to use safer sex practices because we identified these couples as couples that were not using um, any form of protection, um, STI protection, um, at least some of the time that they were having sex. And so through, and these were heterosexual couples and through these, um, through that research, I was in charge of recruitment and retention. I actually spoke to a lot of the patients. A lot of the female patients like really didn't know that much about their own anatomy, their own bodies, or how to keep themselves healthy and like reproductive health wise. And um, I thought that was like really fascinating because I was like, you know, these, oh, at the time I was like, I don't know, 22, 23. And I'm thinking like, you know, a lot of these people were older than me and didn't know like anything about their bodies, especially when it came to reproductive health. So I started getting more interested in that. And then also too, I was in charge, I became like an HIV um, testing counselor person through that because I needed that as part of my job. And then um, through a lot of the networking that I did, I ended up getting really interested in like women's health. And so um, that's kind of what brought me into med school. And also, so I started off med school thinking I wanted to do something women's health focused. The thing that kind of made it interesting about the whole deal was um, I didn't know, like OBGYN is a very surgical specialty. Like we do C-sections, we do hysterectomies, we do laparoscopy, we do a lot of surgical things. And I didn't think that that was something that I necessarily wanted to do when I went into med school. So I was thinking I was probably gonna go into something like family medicine with a reproductive health focus. But when I, started doing my third year rotations, I actually really liked the surgical aspects of OBGYN. And I also like general surgery as well, but I really liked the fact that I could integrate all of my, my um, passions and things that I like in OBGYN, because not only was I dealing with female reproductive health, but I could you know, also leverage some of my passions for patient education and things like that through the type of medicine I was practicing. Definitely. It sounds like the surgical part of it, you mentioned that OB has a good consulting and surgical part of it. Uh, yeah. I know a few, like, for example, subspecialists in, say, maternal fetal medicine, that they just concentrate on only consulting. Um, what do you think really, in terms of maybe it might be personality, maybe it just might be um, work-life balance, how does it reflect on the other side of life outside of work when you are taking on surgeries versus just taking on consulting, et cetera? Well, it depends on how you balance it all. And it depends on the type of group you work with or for and how that all works. Because um, in OBGYN, we do have a whole bunch of subspecialties. You mentioned maternal fetal medicine, that's high risk obstetrics. So that's like really complicated pregnant patients that um, those specialists deal with. I'm a general OBGYN, so I kind of do all of it. Um, and there's, you know, GYN oncologists, they deal with really big um, gynecologic cancer cases. There's minimally invasive GYN surgeons who do a lot, like a, a lot of advanced laparoscopy. There's infertility specialists, like so reproductive endocrinology and infertility and things like that. And so those are people who do IVF and like assisted reproductive technology. I mean, there's quite a few different um, subspecialties within OBGYN. So, um, in terms of like whether, you know, like if it's like a personality thing or a schedule thing, it, 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 all, it, it all kind of depends because what you come to realize when you get out there in the world is that there are a whole bunch of different types of ways to work. And there's a whole bunch of different ways to, like for example, right now, the um, hospital and group that I work with, we have about 12 generalist OBGYNs, right? And so I take um, 24 hour call three times a month, right? Which for OBGYNs and uh, like other times I've had jobs, that was not the case. I actually worked a lot, did a lot more 24 hour calls. And then there's some practices that do none, you know? And um, also too, like in terms of the amount of time I, you know, am able to operate. 
I am a generalist, so I operate when like, you know, for emergency purposes, like, you know, somebody comes in with like an ovarian torsion where their ovaries twisted on itself or, you know, things like that I'll do. Um, I have some scheduled cases, but I don't operate as much as let's say a GYN oncologist where it's like, they may have like two or three days a week that they're operating. And then the other days they're seeing patients in the clinic. So, and then even with those, like, you know, there are people who have schedules that would be considered part-time for some groups, but for their group it's full-time. So it's very, it's very dependent. And so that's why I always say like, you'll hear a lot of people talk about work like balance in choosing maybe your specialty based on that or subspecialty based on that. But like medicine is so flexible that like you could really find something that you can work with in terms of your schedule. And OBGYN tends to be a specialty that is notorious for poor work-life balance. Um, and I've experienced that myself. But it's one of those things where, again, it's like, you know, maybe for a period of your career, that might be the case, but you may be able to find some things and, you you know, you have to kind of wiggle and work with it um, that will allow you to live the life that you want to. Definitely. And you mentioned earlier that even before medical school, research almost kind of in one way or another, or in at least some ways, defined how you thought to proceed from there with women's health. So for the people listening, the majority of which are pre-med students, pre-health students, um, at that stage where you did find your passion for women's health, how do you recommend that they put themselves out there in terms of research opportunities, um, opportunities like this with virtual shadowing? How do you think networking around that um, can be best optimized? I think really, truly taking advantage of what you like. Like, like, I feel like everybody focuses on what they should be doing, right? So it's like, I should be doing research and maybe I think this research is gonna look good because I ultimately want to be X, Y, Z type of doctor or whatnot or vet or whatever the case may be. The thing is, is that, let me tell you, most people I know have changed their minds in terms of what they want to do, like what they thought they were going to be. So like plenty of them, like plenty of people were like, yeah, I think I want to be a dermatologist, right? Like when I grow up or I want to be a plastic surgeon or I want to be whatever. And you know what? Like you pursue that research, see if you like it. And then let's say you do it and you're like, I actually really hate this. It was a valuable experience because hey, you realize what you don't want to do. Additionally, like doing research or, you know, these shadowing opportunities or things like that, um, really getting to know the people who are working or the people you're working with or whatnot is a valuable experience in and of itself because, okay, maybe you don't end up wanting to do like OBGYN or you don't end up wanting to do research, you know, on HIV or something like that. But like one big thing you learn is one big thing I learned, which has helped me throughout life is how to interview patients or interview people, how to talk to people because, when I was doing recruitment, recruit like recruitment and retention, I had to talk to a whole bunch of different types of people who were from all different walks of life um, to get the type of information that I needed from them. And I also had to ask them a lot of questions that are considered very taboo and whatever. So like, I feel like ultimately I gained a skill that regardless of whatever I ended up doing, even if I didn't end up doing reproductive or sexual health or anything like that, I benefited from that experience. So I think that going into experiences and just like really trying to, to go into to them thinking about things that you like to do and trying to find the positive in them, even if you realize that this is not something you're going to end up doing is valuable because I'm telling you, I've had a variety of different, even just random job experiences, like growing up, doing whatever that I think all has contributed, contributed into like how I approach my life now. And you will draw upon those experiences later on and sometimes in the most unexpected ways. Definitely. Um, right now you're involved with 
just like you mentioned, things like Peloton's health and wellness advisory committee, which I mean, the normal academic attending um, involved in a residency program would not necessarily be as in touch with. Um, some people may, out there might be interested in doing the same. So what was your journey of reaching that point to be involved with those, um, with, with those advocacy and advisory committees, committees? Well, so I think it's really um, thinking outside of the box because so when you go to med school and like, you know, you kind of go from being an undergrad and then going to med school and doing residency, everything is academic, right? Everything you see is academic. Maybe in residency, you start to see some people like you may have some attending physicians that you work with who are, you know, in private practice and they have, um, they have privileges at your hospital. So you may interact with them a little bit and, but you only see a glimpse of it, right? And so basically everyone who's talking to you up until you like are done with residency has been on an academic track because everyone who's teaching you is on an academic track. But what I think we fail to realize is that that's not the only way that you can do it. And then sometimes people also look at non-academic clinicians as like people who like care more about money or care more about this. And I would, and there are definitely those people, but I definitely think that for me, one thing that I have found um, that I've always wondered was like, how can we bridge the gap between like patients and medical professionals, right? Because I feel like in academic medicine, we're always talking about patients. And like, yes, we do talk to patients, but we do a lot more of talking about patients, right? And I felt like with some of the advisory roles and some of the things that I do, which uh, often center the patient, I feel like I was able to bridge that gap. And so for me, it was making a conscious effort. And sorry, my dog is going to be barking at, at random times. She is okay. <laughs> but um, like for me, I really like, you know, thought outside the box a bit, right? Where I was like, okay, like I've kind of done, I was in the military. Like I thought I was gonna be an academic, like purely academic clinician. And then I was just like, but I don't know if this is something that I really wanna do. I'm actually really passionate about patient education. And I saw, especially with social media, that most of my patients were getting all kinds of crazy ideas from social media about their bodies and what they should do with them. And then that's when I was like, well, maybe I should, like what's wrong with me being a person on social media, like giving my thoughts as somebody who's studied this and works doing this. And from there, these advisory roles kind of popped up, you know, which has been, I'm grateful for them because I feel like people are also acknowledging the fact that we do need more medical oversight over, you know, certain things like exercise and, you know, like, or, or just like, and also figuring out ways how to communicate with people about their bodies. Definitely. It's a great way to, to um, like, or another channel to go through advocacy as a physician, um, really yeah. taking patient care to the next level. We have one student who asks, through the grueling training you've been, four years of undergrad, four years of med school, four years of residency, um, four years, like you said, of active duty um, in the army, what was the most difficult part? Um, I would say residency. Residency was really, really challenging because you learn that there are new levels to being tired that you never ever thought was possible. And so like, for example, um, it's like, cause with residency too, it's not just like that your actual shifts are busy and exhausting. You have to come home and study. Like it's, you're, you, cause you're still having to take exams or guess what? Like, you know, you come home, you go, you go into work at 6 a.m., right? You round and you round and you round, and then you know you have a day of seeing patients or whatever you're doing, and then let's say you come home at seven or eight, right? That's already a long time. And then when you get home, you're like, "Crap! I have I'm in the operating room with this 
you know, with whoever, whatever attending, and they have like, you know, three big cases tomorrow. And I need to review all the anatomy. I have to review all the facts of the case. I have to review how to do that surgery, you know, all kinds of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're spending your evenings like studying as well. And so um, it can be a lot, you know, and it's, it, it pushes the limits of exhaustion, <laughs> definitely. Tag along with that, um, a lot of people say that study strategies are the name of the game when it comes to efficiency, whether you're studying for the MCAT boards, USMLE, et cetera. Um, so along your journey, maybe through undergrad to med school, it changed from med school to residency, it changed. How did you find the right study strategy for yourself? Well, one big thing is that I think in like my post back time and in medical school, I found like the optimal studying for me, which is like, like I actually learn a lot from reading. And so like, I know that I need to be able to read things and give myself time to read things to understand it. But it's just like, get, for me, it's like, get in where you fit in, you know what I mean? So it's like, sorry about her, <laughs> um, get in where you fit in, you know? So it's like, really like, yes, I set some like concrete times to do my studying, but then I had like, I would, you know, set some, like, you know, I have an hour here, an hour there, I need to review things really quick. So, I mean, for my standardized tests, I've kind of done the same thing for those, which is just like set block periods of time. And I treat studying like a job. And so like when you have to do your USMLEs and then for us, like um, our studies for like our board certification exams and things like that, which are even more grueling. And then we still like the exams never end. <laughs> like that's the other thing, like you're constantly still taking exams, like to maintain my board certification, I have to take exams and such. And so through those, you know, you I just learned for me, I have to treat studying like a job. So it's like, if I have a test coming up or something like that, you know, it's just like, okay, this day is dedicated for me to study for X, Y, Z, or these days are dedicated for that. And, you know, you take it from there. Definitely. And you mentioned there about your post back for those considering a post back and listening in here, um, what is your recommendation over how to proceed with it? I know that, like you just said, you took research um, during post back before medical school, and that's how you found your eventual passion with um, women's health, and that carries on to today. So it was a great learning experience for yourself. Um, and a lot of people say the same thing in their own journeys and experiences. They find it very helpful um, to have those one or two years bef before medical school. So for those considering it, what is your recommendation? What are the tips of making the most uh, use of it? So um, I'm actually really grateful for it because I feel like, as I said before, I think it's where I really kind of solidified my study strategy, like going into med school. And it really helped me because I feel like I went into it like very focused, um, which is not to say that there are people who don't come out of undergrad like extremely focused, but I think that um, when a lot of people who, you know, take a little bit of extra time. And it's something that actually people tell you in med school that they see that some people who like don't go straight through necessarily, like they really know they want to be there. And so like a lot of times with the post back, you also like know that you really want to be, you know, to be a doctor, want to go to med school. And so you learn the strategies you need to, to like get there. And is it like, you know, do I need to, do I work better in groups or do I do better setting on my own? Do I need a lot of office hours? Do I not like, you know what I mean? Am I like a morning person or a night person? Like, I feel like you really get that. And because you're, you're like really kind of hyper-focused to get to, med school ultimately, I think that it, it really kind of makes you figure out, get the kinks out, figure it out before you get to med school. And I find that um, a lot of people who've done post -backs tend to do well in med school. Definitely. We have another student asking um, about how many people wanting to go into medicine, they have goals of entering specifically in private practice. So what was your experience going in and out of private practice and what is your advice for those interested? 
So um, it's all really interesting, you know, in terms of like the way, what you can do in medicine. I think what people don't realize is that there's so many different like pathways and they can look very different for everyone else. So like, for example, like I actually never wanted to go into private practice, never thought it was something that I was going to do. And then basically I was getting out of the military and I applied to a whole bunch of jobs and this job was offering me a uh, way higher salary than like, I mean, like significantly higher than everyone else. And I was like, I mean, you know, it's like one of those things where you're like, I think I'm going to be really dumb if I say no to this or always wonder like, what like what what's that about and so I did it because I was like academic medicine and or whatever situation outside of private practice will always be there I can get a job doing that that's actually one of the nice things about medicine is that like you will have a job <laughs> like it depends on what you want to do but you will always have a job um and so I went into it and the thing for me that didn't like for me that didn't work that can work for other people is more so like it's some people really like being very individual in the way they practice right and like they don't want to know, there's a lot of oversight when you work in big groups like academic centers like big hospital systems, big groups, like things like that, right? There's a lot of, you know, like regulatory things and all that stuff that you have to keep up with and people are always checking and reviewing and this and that. In private practice, you set that whole thing yourself, right? And like, you know, depending on how that, how that is, um, if you're somebody who's really driven and your practice private practice that you're in is really driven in evidence-based medicine and staying up to date and things like that, it, you know, it could work out really well for you if that's like something that you like, or there are people who get set in their ways and that works for them as well. And so it's really one of those things where like for me as somebody who always likes to be very, very evidence-based and like focused on that, it, it, it was, it, I didn't like the lack of oversight of things for me, like, but it works for some people because some people like, you know, want to be able to tailor their practice to their needs or what their patients need. So like, you know, there's like levels to boutique medicine, as I like to say. So like, sometimes it's like, none of it's necessarily wrong, but you know, you may or may not like that. So like in private practice, you may end up, you know, prescribing things that aren't harmful to anybody, but it's not quite based in evidence, right? And it's to keep people happy. And some people don't mind doing that and they're okay with it. Other people don't, you know, or like another thing too is in private practice, you tend to have to be at um, like kind of almost always on call because, um, if your patients call, can call you like on a random day or whatnot and to the answering service and you have to talk to them, you know, as opposed, and it's usually fewer, you know, you don't have as many partners and things like that. So you're usually always on as opposed to where I work now. I told you I work with like 11 other people. And so when I'm off of work, I'm like off because someone else is covering. That's not always the case in private practice. So those are some of the reasons why it wasn't for me, but like some people really love it and they spend their whole career that way. Yeah. Yeah. Just like you said, there's a lot of different paths and ways, not only to getting to medicine, but even as an attending, whether it be private practice, advocacy, mm -hmm. like you're involved with, um, academia, et cetera. Another student is asking specifically about your opinion on how things are going to be with COVID. So COVID has been going on for around two years We've been in and out of being in person online, but all in all, it's affected how well students can get enough clinical experiences. In your opinion, how oh, do you yeah. think that might, be, that might play into the, the acceptance rate for medical school with someone lacking that clinical experience? Well, I don't think people are going to hold it against um, others. Like if you can't, um, if you weren't able to be in person for um, any sort of shadowing or things like that, because we're already having, because um, my hospital is affiliated with Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And like, 
I mean, for a good chunk of last year, there was no in-person, like the people were doing clinical rotations in medical school could not do them in person. And I mean, they tried to have them come back for a cute few days here and there to like get the experiences that they didn't, but they clearly weren't. And even now it's like very, it's somewhat different. Like whenever there are surges, they try to limit the amount of people. So they'll limit the amount of, um, like med students who participate. So I say all of that to say that even like med students are not getting as many clinical opportunities. So I think that will all be taken into account, you know, when people submit their applications in terms of their ability to, to get certain experiences to like, you know, make their application stronger, I guess. Definitely. And again, your story is very, very unique. It's always interesting to hear another um, interesting story like yours. Looking back, though, um, you know, we're in an audience of a lot of pre-medical students. They have years ahead of them that they can apply the advice that they get now. So looking back, any tips of advice that you would give out there um, for things that you might do differently that other people here might be able to use and apply towards their later years of training? Um, so, I mean, I don't really have like many regrets in how I did things because it was so unique. Because like my thing is that I think what was helpful was the fact that like when I applied to med school, I knew I really wanted to go. I didn't have any doubts at that point. I feel like if I had applied to med school, like at some, like my June senior year, whenever you apply to med school, I'm this is bad. Like I'm not that old, but now I feel like I'm being like, that old. like, when do you apply to med school? Whatever. In college, like if, if in college I was like, I'm going to apply to med school to go to med school right after I'm done. I feel like I would have had a lot of regrets because I feel like I was not, I didn't really think I wanted to be like, I didn't know if I wanted to be a doctor, like a physician, because the thing that's kind of interesting that I think is really nice about what's happening right now is that there's more transparency in the types of careers you can be in that are not necessarily being a physician. Like you can talk about going into a career like as an epidemiologist, like public health or, um, you know, hospital administration, if that's something you want to do, or, you know, just like all of these or doing like research or whatnot. Like, I feel like when I was coming up, like literally people were like, I want to be a doctor or a nurse or whatever. Like, those are the things you knew about the medical field. And, and then like, you would learn about like these specific special specialists. So like, I want to be a plastic surgeon. I want to be a neonatologist. I want to be this, I want to be that. And like, there could be something in the background in you where you're like, I don't know if I want to even like touch sick people. Like, I remember that was actually a big thing for me. I was like, I don't know if I actually am going to be okay being <laughs> around sick people all the time. And that was one of the main reasons why I was like, I don't know if, med you know, if clinical medicine is for me. Additionally, I liked thinking about things on a little bit more of a community or a global scale where it was like, it's nice to be able to take care of the person in front of me, but like, what about the system? What about that stuff? And I kind of ended up circling a bit back to that later in my career, like now where I am. But like, when I was first starting out, I was like, I don't know if I want to like, just see patients right in front of me. What if I want to like, do more policy driven stuff? And so I go to med school was important. And I think that is what's going to like propel you forward. Because I know, I actually know some, some people who've dropped out of med school because they did go straight through and they realized in med school that it wasn't for them. And they weren't, and these are even people who were not like having trouble academically. They literally just figure they were like, I don't like this. I don't want to do this. And, you know, at any point you figure that out, it's great, but probably before you take out a whole bunch of loans and, you know, take that deep dive, it, it, it would be better if you figure that out probably before you started the journey. Definitely. And looking at your, your days of practicing now, what does continuity of care with patients look like in ob -GYN? So that's one of the, like, 
pluses about OBGYN. So we're not like family medicine or internal medicine, like, you know, kind of your PCP traditionally who can see somebody for like, you know, 30 years or even like family medicine, they'll see your grandmother and your like mom and your you know, cousin, whatever. They're seeing like everyone through your child through their lifespan. But like for OBGYN, like a lot of times, you know, we continuity of care can look a few different ways like we see people through their whole entire pregnancy that's like you know 10 months right so that's actually a long period of time because if you think about like you know general surgeons right like if you have appendicitis they take your appendix out and see you later like I probably will never see you again <laughs> you know what I mean or like so your plastic surgeon like I do a breast augmentation again like see you for your pre-op, post-op, surgical care, probably won't see you again unless you have another procedure, right? But for us, we'll see people for 10 months for that. Then, you know, let's say you decide that you want to get your annual exams with me. So I'll see you every year. And, you know, I do your PAP. If you have any medical problems, I, you know, in that are GYN specific, I'll take care of that, you know. And so sometimes you can have patients that you see for many years. Sometimes you have people you see for just a short period of time. But typically, it's, it's not very often that we see somebody just once, <laughs> And so that's what's really cool about continuity of care. You, you get to know people, and especially if they have some sort of GYN issue, you really get to know them because you're seeing them fairly often and maybe for an extended period of time. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned when you were going into medical school, you were interested in women's health, but you were torn between family practice with an emphasis on women's health versus mm -hmm. as an OBGYN. What's the difference there in terms of practicing as a family medicine uh, physician? Yeah with uh, women's health as your emphasis versus ob -GYN. So um, in terms of the differences, so all of the surgical pieces for the most part, like so um, spe specifically GYN side of things, right? Um, family med with a focus on women's health, they don't do hysterectomies, they don't do laparoscopy, they don't do like anything that is like sur the surgical piece of it. There's rare cases where some of them will do some minor procedures, but for the most part, most of the surgical things that we do, which is actually a good chunk of gynecology, um, they don't do. And then managing like more complicated things like fibroids and stuff like that, again, we take care of that as GYNs, like your family practice um, peeps will take care of, they'll, they can do like initial workup. So they'll, you know, they can do PAPs, they can test for STDs. Um, they can take care of like, kind of like smaller issues and they can begin workups for like, if you have abnormal uterine bleeding, like, you know, abnormal periods, things like that, they can take care of that. And they usually pass it on to us as it gets more complex. Um, and we can take care of that. We can do all of it. Um, on the obstetric side, it depends, right? So basically for um, like an obstetrician versus family practice, an obstetrician of uh, family practice doc, they can deliver babies. And then there's some that are like OB focused where they actually train to learn how to do C-sections. So there are some family practice docs that can do C-sections unsupervised and things like that. Um, in terms of um, obstetricians, we do C-sections, we do all vaginal deliveries, prenatal care, postnatal care, things like that. We take care of um, like slightly more complicated cases, like, you know, people with diabetes and pregnancy and things like that. And a lot of times we can work in conjunction with the high-risk OB docs to determine the, the plan of care for a patient. Additionally, um, we do more complicated C-sections. We can do cesarean hysterectomies, which are like really serious and things like that. So that's, that's, that's the difference. We just basically do more complicated stuff. And as an OB, I'm sure that you've had a lot of experience through training, now as an attending with a lot of patient cases. Through that time, are there any specific and unique patient cases that you remember? Uh, maybe we can discuss them here. Specific patients? Well, yeah, so, outside of the HIPAA names and all that, well, the, the actual cases themselves with, you know, 
how the the um, the the approach to care went, things like that. Um, okay, so I'm like, let me think of anything that I thought was particularly interesting. Um, well, there, I'll talk about a case that I had today. So there's a patient that I had who she's like, I think she's like 42. She um, has had two kids and basically had normal periods and all this stuff up until October. And she had a period that has just ended like two days ago. So she bled from October 15th till what, November 30th, 29th, whatever, right? And she was just saying like, it's bad. Like I had given her medications to try to stop the bleeding, um, like including progesterone, um, which is, we do make progesterone, but you can get synthetic progesterone because it, the way that it acts on the uterus is that it causes the uterine lining to stabilize a lot of times. So if someone's bleeding heavily, if you give them high dose progesterone, it can stop that. Um, for her, in her case, it really didn't stop it. Um, and then in the meantime, I also got her an ultrasound. So I sent her to radiology to get an ultrasound. On the ultrasound, um, it showed that um, she, it looked like she might have a polyp in, or a fibroid within the lining of her uterus. And so a fibroid, for those who don't know what that is, is a non-cancerous growth in the uterus, like a tumor, but it's not cancerous and it can cause a variety of different symptoms. Some of it is bleeding, some of it is pain. Um, and if they grow big enough, which they can grow fairly large, um, it can make people feel bloated, it can cause distension of the abdomen, um, just all in all can be a nuisance, right? But for some people, they don't experience any of those symptoms. It's thought that about 50% of women have will develop fibroids at any point in their lives and is more common actually in African American women. It can be up to 80% of African American women will have fibroids at any point in their lives. So um and a polyp is just like uh like fleshy growth that and uh, both of which could bleed given the location that it was. So I um scheduled this patient for a hysteroscopy, which is basically what it is, it's a camera, like a little scope, and we put it in through the cervix, which is the bottom part of the uterus. So there's no like um, incision on the abdomen or anything like that. So it's all vaginally. So we go in vaginally with the scope and put it in through the cervix. And then we distend this, the uterus with saline. And then we're able to look at the cavity through with the scope, right? And there I'm looking for the polyp or the fibroid so that I can remove it. And there's instruments that we can pass through the scope that will allow me to do that, right? And basically it looks like a big video game because we're looking at it on the screen. If any of you guys have seen laparoscopic surgery where um, that's a different type of scope that's used, which it goes through your belly button and then you can use other instruments put in through other ports on your belly. And again, looks like a video game. You can remove things that way. Anyway, the hysteroscope, the hysteroscopy that I did, when I looked in, actually, I didn't see a polyp or anything like that. I just saw like lots of excess tissue in there. So I did something called a DNC or a dilation and curatage, where I use an instrument to basically um, gently like scrape the lining of the uterus, all that extra tissue out, send it to the pathologist to lay, look at at the lab to make sure that there's no cancerous or precancerous cells in there. Because the concern when we see really um, like a lot of tissue in there is that it could be either like something like endometrial cancer or precancerous changes that could lead to endometrial cancer. It's not very likely that it was, but we have to rule that out. So I did that and my hope is that she will not have any more bleeding, but I don't think that's gonna be the case. So we're probably gonna have to put her on some sort of hormonal therapy or something like that to regulate her bleeding a little bit better. That's an OBGYN, especially for the obstetric side, you're you're caring for the baby and also the mother, um, also the father would be involved sometimes too. So it's really unique in that aspect because it's almost like caring for the whole family all at once because it's kind of one centered event. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. birth, so it's quite a 
um, major event in the family, I'm sure. Yeah. Are there any specific cases you have where possibly the baby had complications, the mother had complications, and that kind of made the case a bit trickier to, to solve? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that happens a lot of the time. So, like, for example, like in cases of what we call fetal growth restriction, right? So, like, you know, we expect it's just kind of like, you know, when people are on the outside, we expect, like, especially pediatricians get really caught up on this. It's like the growth chart, the growth curve, right? So, like, like children are supposed to grow a certain amount, you know, per year, whatever interval, right? And um, if even if a child is small, they should still be kind of growing along this curve. And if they fall off the curve, meaning that they're not growing appropriately, you're concerned about nutritional status. We actually look at that um, in utero as well. And there are certain conditions that mom and or baby can have that can cause what we call fetal growth restriction. And so com common culprits for that are things like high blood pressure in mom, or diabetes in mom, because diabetes can actually cause baby to either be too big or too small, depending on like what kind of diabetes, like when, like if you have diabetes just purely in pregnancy or if you had it before you were pregnant. Um, there's also infections mom can get that can be passed to the baby that can cause the baby to fall off the growth curve. Or um, there's situations with like genetic disorders in the the fetus that can cause the baby not to grow appropriately. And so like, for example, like I had a patient actually like, yes, yesterday or the day before, I can't remember, who I was seeing her in clinic for her normal, normal, like prenatal visit, right? And she has a history of high, hypertension, high blood pressure before pregnancy. And she also has a history of diabetes before pregnancy. And it's crazy because she's like 31. So she's not that old, right? But she has all these medical complications. And so she hadn't been doing that great of a job of like taking care of her blood pressure or her diabetes because we have... Um, we have these pregnant patients keep a log. And so on her log, there are a lot of abnormal values in terms of her blood sugars and also her blood pressures. And she was like forgetting to take her insulin and forgetting to take her blood pressure medications at times and whatnot. And what we also found was that her baby was not growing appropriately. Her baby was not only small, but between the sano that she had that day before she saw me and the sano that she had four weeks prior, her baby didn't grow that much, right? And so that's really concerning because um, the reason why babies um, have trouble growing when, they're, um, when their moms have high blood pressure or diabetes is because it affects the vessels of the placenta and the placenta is what gives nutrients to the baby. And so if those vessels are compromised by like, high blood pressure, which makes the, the vessels nar more narrow, and so does um, diabetes, then there's not enough nutrient exchange and then the babies don't grow. And so we saw evidence of that, which was support like in the um, ultrasounds that we had gotten on this baby and through her um, monitoring. So basically I had a conversation with, um, the maternal fetal medicine doctor, the high-risk OB doctor, to be like, what do you want to do? She's like, you know, 36 and 36 weeks pregnant, 37 weeks is considered full term. Like, what benefits or risks, you know, do you see in continuing to keep her pregnant or whatnot? And basically the what um the maternal fetal medicine doctor decided was that given how severe the baby's growth restriction was and that the baby wasn't growing and the fact that um, the mom had poorly controlled diabetes and poorly controlled high blood pressure, it was in the best interest for the baby to be delivered like that day. And um, it's always a conversation that you have to have with the patient because, you know, most people don't go into pregnancies thinking, oh, I'm going to have my baby like super early. And, you know, what about like 
like the NICU, like like neonatal intensive care unit, like is my kid going to end up there? Is this okay? Like, am I going to end up with a C-section? Do I need a C-section? And so it was a lot of talks about like, you know, I'm really, con we're really concerned about your baby, you know, and that like, because with fetal growth restriction, the reason why we're so concerned about it is not that the baby's just, not just that the baby's small, it's that the baby may not survive the pregnancy if we continue. You. So we're afraid that those vessels are going to keep, you know, faltering the way they do. And then the baby's not going to get enough nutrients and ultimately like die from that. And so, you know, it's like having those types of conversations, which, you know, sometimes you have to talk about, you know, kind of talk to your patient about not only what they feel and what they want, but what's also going on with this, the baby they're carrying. Cause sometimes, you know, it's like, and it's, it's a human response where like you're getting thrown all of this information to you and it's not what you were expecting to hear or what you want to hear, but, um, it's for the best interest, not even necessarily of you, but of the baby you're carrying. So it's a, it's weaving through that, which can become challenging, but ultimately she ended up being okay. And the baby was born and is doing fine. And they're all doing fine. All right. Great to hear some good news then at the end. Um, mm -hmm. We have another student asking about cryptic pregnancies. So have you ever had to deal with a cryptic pregnancy and how do you normally have to go through with those? So I personally have not had to deal with a cryptic pregnancy. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's like people who um, think they're pregnant and they're not. And so um, it's very, it's something you have to deal with psych and a lot, like it's, it's a tough, tough situation to deal with because I actually was talking to one of my colleagues who, and actually a few of my colleagues because this, patient would come all the time for years thinking she was pregnant and like to the point where she had been rushed in by an ambulance before and you know because she told them like I'm in labor and whatnot and it's like she you know her belly was a bit distended and whatnot so they were like concerned and you know she was never pregnant and so it's really a big um thing that I think psych needs to be involved in pretty early on because it, it it's it, it's it's sad because like they really do believe they're pregnant and or and then like when you try to break it to them and it's not the way you they like it they can accuse you of like killing their baby it's like really it can be really intense you discussed earlier a few cases or one case from um a recent patient who had issues with, as a mother, had complications, the baby had complications, and those kind of um, both played to have a greater effect, make the case a little more complicated. Uh, in the cases, though, of, say, twins, where just having both fetuses in the placenta, the placenta is not able to produce enough nutrients for both or enough oxygen, like with twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome, how do you approach those kind of cases? Well, again, that's one that you really have to have a big talk with the family about, you know, because like typically if you continue the pregnancy, the way it's going to go, they both end up dying. Like it's usually not just one. And so a lot of times with twin to twin transfusion, you actually have to like tell them, hey, one, you know one baby, like we have to cut off the supply to one baby to save the other, or like, depending on where you are in it, right? Because there's sometimes if you catch it super early, you can um, kind of cut off the joined blood vessels that the two share, and then you can save both. But so, um, there's sometimes where unfortunately you can't, and you have to have a conversation with, you know, the family, with the patient, everything about like, what that all means, like whether it's like, hey, do you, you know, like we're going to do this and one of these babies are going to perish, like, you know, how do you feel about that? Is that something you'd want to do? But ultimately, it's a decision that the patient has to make. And I think near the end of the hour, maybe we can wrap up with one more question. So um, I think for those listening in, this might be a really helpful one. You mentioned how 
having those rotations in your third year, I think it was a medical school, it solidified your choice to go with OB, um, GYN. For those listening, I know most of them are pre-medical students, but a few years ahead, medical school is pretty close. How should they take advantage of rotations and electives to make sure that they can really dive into answering the question of whether they like that field or not? Um, so you're talking about like what you guys could do now or like in med school? In med school. So when it comes time to yeah. do those rotations and electives, how should we approach them? I say like dive, like, so for example, I knew I don't like psych, right? Like, I mean, I like psych on like a peripheral, like, you know, you read stuff in a magazine level, but like schizophrenia and all that stuff freaks me out. Like I have never really enjoyed any of that kind of stuff. And then PD, like pediatrics has not been something, also something that I thought I would enjoy or anything like that. And so going into those rotations and going into every rotation, I always said, I need to pick up five things from here that's useful. <laughs> like five things that like are gonna be useful for like the rest of my life. Mind you, like, you usually pick up way more than five things, but you need at least five good ones, right? And so going into that, like, really made me truly dive into, like, every rotation I went into. And you really want to give it your all while you're there because you can be surprised at what you end up liking. Like, I didn't think I was going to like anything surgical. And then I did my OBGYN rotation. I did my general surgery rotation and I really liked both. You know, I actually really enjoyed internal medicine, things like that. And it's because like, you know, getting to know your patients, that's another big thing too. It's like many of us go into medicine. We not only like science, but we probably don't mind people either, unless you want to go into like radiology or path or whatever. But like, you know, most of us like enjoy like talking to people, getting to know people, getting to know what makes them tick and things like that. Like own that and really delve into that because what I ended up doing was like getting really involved in the cases and like getting to know my patients. And like the, the old adage is that the medical student like can always tell you something random that you probably need to know about this patient when you're in a bind. So like, for example, you are the person in the team that has the most time with the patient, period. You really do. Like, and that's what people like um, med students should know. Like, you don't have to spend the whole time because I've seen med students approach rotations a whole bunch of different ways now as not only during my residency, but as an attending, like supervising med students. Some of them I'm sitting like, you know, in like the place where I chart, where all like docs and medical providers sit and the med students, they're reading a book, right? <laughs> or like putzing around on the computer or on their phone. And then they're the med students that you're always looking for, right? And actually most times they're not just like, you know, like messing around somewhere, whatever. They're usually actually talking to the patients, right? And those are like the most valuable med students. Why? Because like, let me tell you, like when it's time to know, hey, like this baby's about to come, where's her like spouse or partner or whatever <laughs> that med student usually knows <laughs> like you know what I mean and that's actually a valuable thing or like an allergy that could have been missed because that's actually happened before where it's like med students take super detailed histories and or just talk to the patients more and that patient may have forgotten to tell people that they're allergic to latex or they're allergic to that but they told the med student and the med student's like hey guys like you might not want to do that because that patient's allergic to latex and it's like you talk to the patient they're like oh yeah I forgot to tell you guys you know but they told the med student so it's like you know getting to know your patients getting to know the case also learning um learning through your cases, right? So one big thing I always tell people is like, it makes it easier to study for your end of rotation um, exams if you study for your cases, study to the cases you're seeing every day. You see something interesting, 
read about it, right? You like, you know, you're gonna see in, an interesting surgery tomorrow, learn all the anatomy, learn all of the, like the, the differential for that, whatever. Because guess what? You'll cover most things if you study to the cases you see, because there's a reason why we put you on rotations is, is to see things, right? And I think sometimes that gets lost because people are like, oh my God, I have to like read, I have to do this. And I'm like, if you read and study to your cases, and that's something that I did, and I know, and I did, you know, very well on my like rotations and things like that, like it made it a lot easier because you're not looking at things for the first time when you read them, when you're studying for your like end of rotation exam, like you've been reading about it all along. So when you're like going to review everything, you're like, oh yeah. And then you can jog your memory. You're like, I remember we had this patient and what did we do for them again? Like we did this, this, and this, because typically in academic institutions, we're following evidence-based medicine. So whatever you're reading about that we should be doing for that patient, that's what we do in real life. So read for your, read for your cases. Definitely, I think that's a, a great piece of advice to end off on. So I think that really wraps up the hour, wraps up the session for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Arabunda, for taking time out of your schedule to join us. Um, we really appreciate it. For our audience to receive the certificate for this session, you must pass the quiz, which is now uploaded to our website. And be sure to join us for our next, vir next virtual chatting session with Dr. Paul on December 15th at 7 p.m. Central. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Arabunda, for joining us, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Good luck to all of you. I hope to see you guys in the future. Of course. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Arabunda. Take care.